Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us um, in our health seminar, which is organised by the Centre for Primary Health and Social Care at the School of Social Professions. So I would like to introduce you to our speaker today, which is um, um, Dr. Kath Matsiba, who is Senior Lecturer in Public Health um, here at London Met. I suppose many of you know Kath uh, already. Um, so it's great to have her in our seminar this afternoon. Um, Kath has worked with various um, organisations um, in the United Kingdom and Zimbabwe, with a special focus on international development partnerships, HIV and AIDS, um, maternal health and vulnerable children. She has published on all these topics and also on the topic she will be presenting today, which is about clay ingestion, a practice um, that is um, accepted as an integral aspect, I believe, of pregnancy in many um, African communities. Um, so, the, well, the topic, um, the full topic of her presentation, you can see it now um, on the screen. Um, we will have time for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. And as usual, I encourage the audience to use the chat box as we go along. Please do so we can get back to those questions um, at the time for discussion. So over to you, Kath. Uh, thank you, Yolanda. Um, okay, so like Yolanda said, I will be sharing on uh, clay ingestion among black African women. And I'll be posing the key question as to whether we can uh, integrate uh, biomedical science and indigenous knowledge systems in terms of um, this practice. I will give you a little background of how uh, a colleague, Martha, Chinoya, who's uh, at the London School of, uh, sorry, she's at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. We did the original study together and we've done um, the one we did last summer together as well, uh, but she's not here. So I'll give you a little background to that as we go along the way. But as a starting point, um, clay is also known as, uh, clay ingestion is also known as geophagy. Um, this is described as a practice of eating earth, clay, etc. You know, I picked up these definitions um, um, and I was comparing them and I was thinking the Collins de definition it is, um, is kind of what we see in the in the current discourse that shapes um, uh, clay ingestion. It says um, this practice is found in primitive tribes. Um, that's what it says in the dictionary. And if we think of primitive tribes, you're thinking of people that are uncivilized, uh, people that are barbaric, people that are savage, you know, and um, this kind of um, framing has caused problems, particularly in terms of public health interventions. But we also have balanced definitions which consider the cultural aspect of the tradition. Um, clay is known by many names in terms, uh, including calabash chalk. Uh, and calabash chalk is usually the, 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 the the word that um, public health England tends to use in um, in, uh, in in communication with public health professionals. So, um, as a starting point, we have the government issuing our repeated warnings via the Food Standard Agency, uh, 2002, 2012, 2011. I'm sure there have been more warnings um, than these ones. And then this is, was followed on by a public health directive to GPs and directors of public health to dissuade African and Asian women from eating clay. This is particularly because of the dangers that are posed by clay. Uh, the warnings that were issued by the Food Standard Agency uh, came about because they found high levels of lead and arsenic in clay that was 
intended for cell and intended for ingestion. Um, and this hasn't just been playing out in the United Kingdom, it's also been happening, for example, in the Netherlands, where clay products were seized and tested, and they were also found to have high levels of toxicity. And uh, we have clay being sold in, in, on the market in, in Birmingham, Leicester, Little, London. And not only that, we've got online shops as well that are, 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 are selling these clay products. So in terms of the health risks, what do we know at the moment? Um, we know that uh, chronic ingestion is associated with anemia, headaches, liver, kidney failure, et cetera, kidney damage. And we also know that in particularly in pregnant women, there are issues to do with affecting the unborn child. We have got miscarriages, premature births, et cetera and impaired uh, brain development and blockages of the intestines and lower birth weight. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting because we do find that um, in terms of uh, uh, mortality rates among uh, Black African women um, and other minority groups, uh, they tend to be overrepresented, uh, not necessarily saying this is linked to this, but if you look at the consumption of clay, um, we are bound to ask questions about this. And in terms of lower levels of exposure, um, clay is known to um, uh, lower levels of exposure in lead, for example. Uh, children's development is affected. Uh, so we've got some behavioral issues, uh, reduced attention span, antisocial behaviors, etc. Um, and, and this is according to, um, to who. Um, I'm sure they've done a lot of research on it to be able to come up um, with this um, with these pointers. Now, in terms of clay ingestion in Africa, where does this clay come from? Um, we are talking about clay products coming from ant hills, uh, termite molds, uh, traditional houses, uh, river basins, etc. But then we also have places where clay mining takes place and is a, is a, is a great is a source of livelihood for hundreds of people, if not thousands. Uh, for example, in Ghana, uh, we have got uh, clay mining that takes place. So they are literally mine shafts where um, people go under to, to get the clay out. And uh, so the clay goes through cycles of baking, baking shaping, and cooking, uh, and uh, basically treated as a food product. And you also have artificial forms mixed with uh, ash, salt, and in some cases, animal fat. And this is sold on the market in, in different shapes, like tablets, small balls or sticks, etc. And the clay is um, selected, carefully selected on the basis of appearance. So not every clay will do, or, and it's not just taken from anywhere, it's taken from traditional sources that are quite well known to have good clay, but obviously this clay is not necessarily scientific tested, scientifically tested for us to know how good it is. So you have got, um, I've got a picture there and you've got clay being sold next to vegetables, um, you know, as a food product. And uh, we have got clay here, um, which is in its original form, and that clay in that yellow plate that has been molded into different shapes and sizes. I have to say, I, I come from Southern Africa, I'm Zimbabwean, and in Zimbabwe, people generally take the clay in its natural form. Uh, but what I've noticed during the course of this research is that in, in West Africa, the clay is shaped, the clay is mixed with other, with other ingredients as well, uh, which was quite novel for me because I, 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 I didn't know that because in Southern Africa, it tends to be in its natural form. So this is what's happening in Africa in terms of the clay, but is it this something that just happens in Africa and has never 
done, has never been anywhere else. I'll refer in particular to ancient Europe, but there is evidence of clay ingestion in, um, in, in North America, Central America, uh, in many, many other parts of the world. But in the European context, there's evidence of humans consuming clay. Um, Greek and Roman histomedical texts, they provide ample evidence of pregnant women eating clay. Um, but we also have a text written during the reign of Tiberius, which links practice to either treating anemia or causing it, which, which resonates with the literature that we have today, that clay can either treat anemia or it can actually cause it. And then we have got um, some other texts uh, from, uh, from, from Italy indicating that clay was um, widely consumed by, uh, by women um, who were pregnant. Uh, but generally, the publications that we have in the British Museum are predominantly from the 17th and the 18th century. Um, there is, um, there is evidence from literature suggesting that, well, perhaps clay did that consumption started in Africa and then it originated to other parts of the world uh, through slavery after the Atlantic slave trade, etc. But all this is open to debate. Um, but um, in terms of uh, the shaping of the narrative, so we know that clay is predominantly consumed in Africa. And we know that in Europe, there's history of clay consumption um, um, centuries ago. But in terms of the discourse, what has shaped the discourse that we, we know today of clay, the discourse that um, shapes uh, the communication that happens between health professionals and, um, uh, and the women, so uh, when we were working on this study, we looked to, um, to the history of clay consumption. And one of the key things that came up was the issue of the medical gaze, where um, you had uh, European physicians who observed African slaves on Caribbean and African plantations in the 18th, 19th centuries, medicalizing clay ingestion and portraying it as a disgraceful practice among the savage. And the idea of the savage resonates with that um, uh, a definition that I gave earlier on from one of the dictionaries and uh, linking it to diseases and to ill health. So, there is a uh, literature of uh, plantation owners fitting their uh, slaves with uh, facial masks so that they would stop ingesting clay because not because they were necessarily worried about them but because they were more concerned about their profits because if your slave uh if you believed ingesting clay was bad for your slave that they would be unwell Therefore, if the slave can't work, then you lose. Or if you then decide to sell on the slave, then they wouldn't fetch as much money. Uh, and then we also have um, the, the, the colonial gaze, where we have um, European colonizers decreeing and naming the, con the reality around clay ingestion. You know, so it was then perceived as a, as a barbaric practice, basically. So within the post-colonial era, biomedical preconceptions continue to shape the discourse. Um, and with the medical gaze emphasizing the disease aspect. And when we look at the literature, we've got so much literature that has been generated that points to, um, to the disease aspect. You know, clay is analyzed for toxicity and then um, there are pointers as to what clinical abnormalities may arise from, uh, from having Inge from ingesting too much clay, et cetera. So there is an overwhelming body of evidence about the potential health implications of ingesting clay. In terms of pregnancy, the intersectionality between ethnicity, pregnancy, and clay ingestion in England, where the latter is viewed as a dangerous practice, generally makes this a very, uh, 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 
as a taboo subject because it's difficult to have uh, the conversation um, that needs to be had. And this suggests that expectant women when just clay in silence, thereby threatening um, the potential of a constructive dialogue between biomedicine and indigenous knowledge. Now, while the leaflet that was published by Public Health England in 2018, I've just taken a few lines. It says, if you discover that your patient is using color bus chalk, they should be dissuaded from doing so. Now, the key question is how are the midwives and the gps to find out or to discover that the women are eating clay because they are eating the clay in silence and the idea that they should be dissuaded from doing so without any understanding of the cultural dynamics that shape um, the ingesting of clay poses challenges um, to uh, effective public health interventions so now that uh, we have talked about clay being shaped by the medical gaze and the colonial gaze, how else can we understand clay ingestion? Uh, Martha and I proposed a cultural framework which is embedded in indigenous knowledge systems. Um, there is already a, 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 a strong body of evidence which shows that clay, uh, clay ingestion is embedded in, 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 in culture, in people's cultures, in different societies, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and when we looked at when we looked at this, we thought actually there is no culture or cultural practice that is embedded outside its indigenous knowledge systems. Um, so we thought, okay, if we can situate this uh, in IK, then we'll be able to ha start having a conversation about biomedical science knowledge and indigenous knowledge. So what is, what, what is indigenous knowledge? Uh, this constitutes long-standing traditions, practices, and beliefs uh, generated and refined, passed from generations in a given society. So this informs decision-making regarding life-sustaining activities, um, thereby forming an integral part of the culture, culture uh, society's cultural identity. So life-sustaining activities can include health issues, uh, and this can include reproductive health issues. Now, uh, in comparison to biomedical science uh, knowledge, Indigenous knowledge systems do not separate secular and rational knowledge from spiritual knowledge, intuitions, and wisdoms. And the distinction between intangible and physical things is often quite blurred. But what jumped out from uh, for us was that we cannot separate cultural context um, from the indigenous knowledge systems from which they arise. So if culture is embedded in these indigenous knowledge systems and it informs people's worldviews, so therefore culture is a crucial determinant of reproductive health behaviors, um, uh, not just for the African women, but uh, for other um, for other societies as well. So, if culture is a, is 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 the sort of guideline that tells us how we ought to live, how we ought to view the world and behave in it, and um, and uh, guides us in terms of how we relate to other people, to the supernatural, um, the environment. And it is that inherited lens through which the individual pursues and understand the world. So if culture is our starting point for how we perceive and we understand the world, so it is a very powerful toolkit for us, um, toolkit for us, because we select our lines of action from there and it, those lines of actions shape our behavior. So, um, so the literature suggests that 
This clay ingestion in pregnancy is embedded in cultural practices shared by many countries. I mean, I, when I was looking at the literature, the, the literature that was a bit missing was North Africa. There wasn't much literature from Africa, but if you looked at South, East, West, um, there was evidence of clay consumption in all those countries. Um, so if we have uh, clay ingestion being so extensively documented as a culturally based phenomenon, um, uh, Professor Ranita says that we should not view it as abnormal behavior. How about we try to have a conversation about um, about clay ingestion in terms of how is it always bad? Is it always useful? Or what can we do to differentiate? Um, so now I will share with you uh, the findings that we 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 derived from the women that we spoke to. Uh, I have findings from two studies. The first one is a larger health audit, um, which which aims to improve antenatal care in North London uh, by seeking to understand the barriers to the booking appointment. Um, and African women were overrepresented in this study. And uh, so the notion of clay ingestion came from there because all the women that we were speaking to, I mean, over half of them, without being prompted, without being asked, they started talking about clay and we followed through with that discussion with them. Um, and then the second study, uh, Martha and I conducted this study over summer and um, I will refer to preliminary findings uh, from the study where we're looking at uh, the experiences of women ingesting clay. And we're also touching upon the risks to try and see if women understood the risks posed by the practice. So uh, what do the women say? So as a starting point, um, women situated their consumption in, 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 in a cultural framework. You know, there was reference to eating clay being part of our culture, you know. And uh, they said that um, when they, you know, one participant said, when they see a woman eating clay, they will say, aha, you are pregnant, you know. And um, when I was pregnant, I would send my husband to get the clay for me, you know, and um, one, uh, one participant says, well, my aunt's mother, pregnant neighbors ate clay back home. You see, for generations after generation, pregnant women have been eating clay. This is uh, from um, a Kenyan mother, you know, and uh, another says, well, it happens in Uganda and all over Africa. It was gross generalization, but there was an understanding that, um, you know, if you're African, you would know about eating clay. Even when I was conducting the study um, and talking to participants that I spoke to, in, even math as well, the participants spoke as if they knew that, as if they expected us to know about clay because we were African. And of course, we did know that, you know, this, uh, people do consume clay. So our findings basically resonated with, with, the, with the large body of evidence that already exists. And um, that women show, women hold the practices and beliefs about pregnancy pass from generation to generation from their countries of origin. Um, and uh, ignoring the social and cultural dimensions has the potential to make public health interventions quite ineffective. And um, so the role of culture in shaping reproductive health behaviors cannot be ignored. And um, if uh, clinical guidance about clay ingestion is grounded in scientific facts, of which it is, because we've got a lot of papers and a lot of studies that have been done on this, uh, but however, there is a key argument that is advanced by Lipton that we we, we really agree with that cultural understandings of the body um, 
health and the causes of diseases are all integral to the epidemiological construction of facts for clinical guidance. So the key question is, when it comes to clay, we don't seem to have that aspect of cultural understanding of, of the body in terms of the interventions that are um, currently out there at the moment. Uh, some of the women raise the issue of cravings. Again, this is something that resonates with the literature that's out there. Um, it says that, you know, it's big business back home in Ghana, most, because most pregnant women crave for it. So they bake it and package it nicely in plastics like sweets. Um, and one participant said, I remember laughing when this participant said this because it sounded so hilarious that if the craving came upon me in the middle of the night, I would wake up for a bite. You know, it was always next to my bedside. The craving was really, really strong. Um, so one participant mentioned that there was the issue about us and they, you know, and she was saying that I would say some of us, eat clay, some of us in course, because we crave for it. White women here crave for other things, but for us, it's clay. So there was the notion that us, as Afri Black African women, this is what we do, but as white women, that's what they do. And because we crave for clay, it should not be seen as something to be ashamed about. Um, and uh, obviously there was concern about people buying and selling, and that coming with concerns about the safety of the clay, et cetera, you know? So the idea that the women already felt, or this participant already felt that there was nothing to be ashamed of, um, highlighted that there, were, there was a level of awareness about the stigma associated with the practice, unlike back home, you know? And uh, whilst pregnancy cravings are considered normal, you know, white women were perceived to satisfy their other cra their cravings through other channels, whereas among us in courts, this was perceived negatively. So women were highly aware, or acutely aware, that eating clay was not perceived favorably at all. You know, so we see. Uh, we see uh, uh, parallel um, narratives here. On the one hand, we have got um, women in their home countries having this cultural expectation to eat clay and it's a socially sanctioned habit. And then in the other context, it's um, you shouldn't eat clay because it's dangerous for you, you know, so. The, the, there is a lot of space um, where conversations could otherwise take place. And then some women highlighted nausea and morning sickness. And um, they said that, you know, some people eat lemons, um, oranges, you know, but clay is an all-rounder, said this Nigerian mother. It can beat morning sickness, you know. Um, so there was a, there was a, there was consensus, you know, in terms of what clay can, can do for you. I've, we've just got a few quotes here, but most of the women would highlight the same things that, you know, it helps with morning sickness, it stops me from vomiting, etc. And if we look at uh, anthropological perspectives on clay, this is actually considered as a as a mineral supplement in some instances, and as a remedy uh, for appetite challenges, along with nausea, morning sickness, and salivation. So there is indeed some evidence that this is what it is used for. Um, and women do find it useful, hence the giving, he, sorry, hence the, 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 the continuous use. And then there was also the notion of clay ingestion uh, as something that is life-giving. Um, if we go back to the to the definition of uh, indigenous knowledge, where um, intangible 
knowledge, so, sorry, intangibles cannot be separated from what's not uh, from uh, from what's physical uh, in terms of people's beliefs, etc. You know, and uh, there was the idea that it is life giving. Um, everything comes from soil. Are we not created from soil? This participant was asking. So when we die, we go back to the soil. So there's nothing strange about eating it, you know. Um, and someone saying, when I was sick in Ghana, I had a difficult pregnancy. I couldn't eat. And the only thing that kept me alive was clay. I didn't have an appetite. I would eat clay, drink some water and go to bed. And that's all she could eat until she had her, her appetite back. And she credits uh, the clay with saving her life. So if, if these are the belief systems that the women hold, the medicalization of pregnancy treats women as vessels devoid of spiritual health that can benefit the mother and the child. You know, because there's the idea that, well, you need these nutrients, you need this, you can get it from this, here's an alternative. But is there an alternative from, from, uh, for, for the spiritual aspect of health? You know, and clay ingestion is also described as in all round in the previous slides. There was the idea of connecting life and death through the women's bodies. Uh, and all these uh, religious connotations between the beginning of life through creation as well as death, uh, uh, when bodies return to earth, resonate with findings uh, from other studies that have been done. Uh, in terms of uh, cons clay consumption among uh, African women. So uh, these findings basically in terms of the spiritual aspect reinforce the notion of a cultural practice embedded in indigenous knowledge where the, there is no separation from rational knowledge, intuitions. Uh, so we have got the lines that are blurred between tangible and intangible. and the, the medicalization of pregnancy, um, this is one area which is outside of reach because that spiritual health, those, those spiritual beliefs cannot be given within the mineral supplements that you might have or the, the multivitamins, uh, for, for example. So, Having said all this and having had the views of the women, um, one other thing that quite jumped out was that um, the approach, the current approach in terms of the interventions is actually strengthening the silence um, because women feel they cannot disclose eating clay. One participant said, uh, this participant had been asked, like, would you tell? Or would you disclose? Uh, and she said, no, you can't tell them you are this person who's eating clay and washing in some leaves from back home uh, to keep the baby healthy. They will think you're crazy. Uh, you don't talk about those things. So like I've said before, women are acutely aware that this is perceived as crazy, you know. So the perception of clay ingestion as a shameful behavior uh, leads to underreporting of its usage in healthcare settings. Um, but because clay is perceived as a food product, uh, on the one hand, the link to the notion of debt, which is also a social construct, compounds stigma issues around um, eating clay. And because of that, women are highly unlikely to disclose eating clay unless the unless the discourse changes unless the narrative changes so positioning clay as a danger we argued and as a subject to be addressed by public health uh, by a public health top-down approach can only strengthen the silence and its position as a taboo subject um, I was quite disappointed the other day I was I, was, I saw this um, on, on, on BBC and it's the people who can't stop eating debt. Uh, okay, okay, this is not very helpful. But again, there is nothing um, 
there's, there's, it's not surprising that 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 discussion should be shaped that way because um, historically it is shaped by a very um, you know by uh, by uh, by the colonial gaze that we spoke to about earlier on. So where do we go from here? Uh, we we have got uh, public health interventions that do not understand the cultural and the social dynamics. And on one hand, we have got women who are continuing to eat clay. So the question we ask is, can knowledge which indicates clay is ingested as a culturally embedded remedy for pregnancy related issues be integrated with medical science, uh, which indicates that some clays pose danger? Repeat, despite the repeated warnings from elsewhere and this study, women continue to consume. Amazon brings out lots of clay products with five star ratings, you know, satisfied customers. Clay in the UK remains unregulated, so the ingredients cannot be monitored or controlled. But there is a history of actually encouraging clay consumption. Uh, 40 years ago, Bradford Council had this eye-catching leaflet which said that clay could be consumed as a mineral nutrient supplement. Can we, can we have an approach like this against the backdrop of scientific tests and checks on clay products to demonstrate safety for human consumption? Um, that's the question that we ask. Is there any safe clay out there? How are we ever going to know it if we don't have the test done, okay? So is it not time to consider appropriate regulation as well with safe clay products, if any, certified for human consumption? Um, but obviously there are challenges, you know. Chemical composition of clay differs greatly depending on the source. So this makes it difficult to either assess potential dangers or benefits to, uh, to health that are, are posed by all clay, because it's coming from all over the world. Where do you even start from? So in recognition also that uh, um, there's been a lot of economic de development and we have the disposal of hazardous chemicals, mining activities have contaminated clay. So there is no denying that clay has been contaminated and some clay is highly toxic for human consumption. So if we are going to frame the discussion around culture as a cultural practice and people would like, you know, hypothetically to practice their culture, um, um, we caught uh, Frazzoli, you know, um, he says that the benefits to risks uh, range of cultural behaviors initiated centuries ago based on traditional medical practices require deep revision. And we absolutely agree that we need to revise. Okay, how do we revise? We need to test. We need to know what's good, what's bad. And uh, if there's any clay out there that is good, we need to be able to test it as part of this revision. So how can we do this without marginalizing other cultural practice and beliefs, often figured as inferior forms of knowing to be replaced by universalized knowledge derived from Western scientific tradition, because this is what we have in terms of clay ingestion. Um, so, I would argue, uh, and, and, and Martha would argue, uh, as we wrote this together, that while acknowledging the cultural dimension of clay and clinical abnormalities that may arise from it, we need a balanced conversation. Um, because what we have at the moment, a lot of studies focusing on toxicity and potential health risks. Potential health benefits associated with clay remain under-researched. So we have this skilled knowledge base 
And this has resulted in a neglect by policymakers. So we have no regulation and we have got blanket campaigns to dissuade women from the practice. So we need further research to consider health claims associated with non-toxic clay with the aim of identifying clay fit for human consumption, if any, you know, do we have any clay that's safe at all? Uh, and in the absence of regulation and clay are satisfied, certified as safe, we need community-led initiatives which can raise awareness. Um, so Public Health England can partner with community organizations to raise awareness, the use of community champions. We can also use our faith platforms, uh, previous research studies on HIV uh, uh, by, uh, by Martha, Eileen O'Keefe and Livingstone, um, Musoro previously highlighted that uh, such platforms can be used quite effectively uh, to address challenges confronting particular subpopulation groups, particularly Black Africans, uh, because the current approach risks further pushing the practice underground. Um, the study that we did last summer, Martha and I, we that women still eat clay, they are ignorant of potential health risks. In the original study, we, we didn't engage potential health risks or anything. But in this study, we did. And the majority of the women had no idea of the potential health risks. And uh, there was no disclosure taking place. Women were not disclosing clay ingestion to GPs, to their midwives during antenatal care because they were acutely aware, again, that this is something that is not, that is viewed favorably within this context. Um, yes, so I end here. Thank you for listening. I've been talking for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kath. That's fascinating. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I'm going to open up to the floor to ask questions. I think that uh, Kelly Cooper has her hands up. Kelly? Thanks, Jolanda. Thanks, Kath. That was a really interesting talk. Um, incidentally, I'm aware of lots of women who have had cravings for chalk whilst pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, so sl slightly off topic, but similar. My question was around, um, so in countries where this practice is more um, widely engaged in or and accepted. Is there um, concern in those countries around the ingestion of clay? And um, if so, what conversations have, have taken place to ensure that um, the, the kind of concerns are addressed? I'm just wondering what lessons could be learned from countries where mm -hmm. the practice is more accepted or, or, or more um, known about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's an interesting question. I mean, I, the, there has been literature that's been published in these countries, but in terms of public health interventions, public health interventions have been lacking. Um, there's no, uh, there's no policy. There's no regulation. One of the key things that um, the Food Standard Agency has done here is the banning of setting. Uh, clay, whereas in those contexts it's sold on open markets and um, we do not have interventions even in those contexts and there is need for interventions and there is need for uh, a conversation just like here. Um, I suppose here the government has responded by saying, hey, this is unhealthy. But in those contexts, the government is like sleep, it's like well, we're sleeping on the job, basically. <laughs> so I suppose the research that you're engaging in um, has potential to impact widely, you know, internationally, not, not only within this context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, 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 is, there, is, there is scope, there is scope. I mean, researchers are beginning to point to clay being very uh, potentially dangerous. Um, I, I, I've seen that in Ghana, I've seen that bit in South Africa, etc. But it's not something that governments have taken up to regulate or the public health agencies have taken up to introduce 
national level um, interventions. Graham? Graham Whitehead. Yes. yes, I'm here. Um, thank, I just want to say thank you, Kath. I'll turn my camera on. Thank you, Kath, for um, a really interesting uh, presentation today. I mean, it's a fascinating theme. Um, what it I don't know if my camera's come on. What it reminded me of was that, um, can you hear me OK? Yes. Okay, what, it, yeah. what, what it reminded me of was that when I lived in the West Midlands uh, eons ago, or I think I mentioned to you once before, Kath, I saw in a shop, um, a corner shop selling like coals and cinders, which was mm -hmm. um, something that pregnant women would would chew on. Um, so I, was, I think I talked about you about that, you know, yeah. maybe a couple of years ago. But it's a similar practice in terms of mineral, uh, a mineral supplement. And so yeah. I was just kind of wondering, does the practice in terms of mineral consumption differ across the you know African content uh, continent in terms of different different minerals for kind of different cultural groups is there any information about that uh, not quite but what seems to uh, jump out uh, from uh, from the literature is that women who crave for clay usually have um, uh, low levels of iron so that so so that kind of like kickstart the craving. So mm -hmm. when they eat that, it then acts as a supplement. Um, but they themselves, whilst they are consuming, obviously they don't know what they are lacking, uh, that they are lacking. But in this uh, previous study we've just done, some women said that look, um, the jeep, you know, they said I was anemic, and then I was on iron tablets. Um, but I still craved for the clay. I still ate the clay, irrespective of the supplements, vitamin supplements I had. Um, so the evidence is mixed, um, bearing in mind that there is also evidence to suggest that the clay can cause anemia as well, because it leads to uh, uh, it. It makes it difficult for um, for the body to absorb iron. Um, yeah, so I, I I think we need more research in that area, Graham, to be able to pinpoint um, the exact minerals that people in different parts of uh, perhaps Africa uh, benefit uh, from the clay that they eat because all the clay is different. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Kath. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Graham. I think um, Rita. Hiya. <laughs> yes, hello. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, Rina, your mic is off, I, I think. Yes, Yolanda, you're right. I was talking to myself. So uh, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Kat, for this uh, indeed a very fascinating uh, work. I, I, I didn't know about the claim ingestion. Um, I think uh, my question is more, uh, you know, like um, along the lines uh, with uh, Graham's. So I know that the clay ingestion is because of uh, cultural uh, uh, reasons. We try to understand that. But what about, uh, you know, try to understand why these women have this craving? Uh, I know that uh, you said uh, that some uh, women have this kind of, uh, you know, iron deficiency. They want to, you know, but have they looked actually or whether there is any uh, genetic predisposition of African women uh, having this craving, for example, for uh, clay? Or I know that, uh, uh, you know, deficiency of some minerals have kind of similar um, symptoms like nausea, dizziness, you know. Uh, have, has anyone looked at the minerals of this population? You know, just maybe if there is some sort of genetic or biochemical predisposition where makes women have this kind of uh, cravings. That, that's a very interesting question, Rina. Thank you. I think the issue of genetic predisposition, I have not, we have not identified any literature looking at that at all. So. Like I said, it's a very under-researched topic. 
and that has not been um, that I, we have not identified any study at all that it, that has looked at that. Not at all. So you, you, there could be it could be the case that there's a genetic predisposition that we just don't know about. That you know just makes the women crave or have this. Uh, and what about the biochemical? I mean, have they looked at other minerals? No iron one or folic acid, vitamin two, uh, uh, B12. I mean, have they looked at other minerals? Yes, uh, they've looked at uh, uh, calcium. Yeah. Uh, some of the yes. clay that uh, that sold is quite rich in calcium, so they have looked at calcium as well. That some of the women they like calcium. Um, but women are the women deficient in calcium? Or... Some of some of the women have been identified to be deficient in in, mm -hmm. in, in calcium, but the evidence is not consistent. Um, one woman might be deficient in iron or in calcium, but but still crave for the clay. Now that would be uh, very interesting, it, uh, I guess. Yeah, um, and I suppose it's not just the issue of craving, because remember these women are pregnant and they are eating to kind of like overcome some of the symptoms like nausea and vomiting, etc. You know, but though obviously others eat it because they're just craving for it. Thank you very much, uh, Kath. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we, thanks, Rina. Um, I think um, Ken White has a, has a question as well. Yeah, thank you very Hi. much. Uh, hello, Kath and everybody. Thanks very much, Kath. It's really interesting. In fact, I, I have an interest in, in iron deficiency anemia. So I've actually read mm -hmm. about this practice and I'm actually writing a, a little review about the genetics for Una, which we have to hear. Okay. Um, but um, so to, uh, in a way, Renner's question sort of prompted my comment that uh, I, I don't know about the genetics. But I know there's uh, interest in the genetics for iron deficiency anemia, but the main problem, of course, is it's a nutritional deficiency in Africa, which is really quite widespread and endemic. And especially when uh, women are pregnant, then they do need to have supplements for iron. And um, Renner mentioned folic acid. In fact, there, there are um, sort of schemes to give uh, women pregnant women, uh, these supplements, uh, folic acid and, and other uh, micronutrients as well. Um, so I can see why, why they need uh, they need to supplement their diet with iron. Um, and it's, uh, it sounds like a horrific way of doing it. It sounds a bit rather hit and miss. It's, it may work in some cases, but not in others. Um, but I just wanted to make that comment. It's just a, a, a fascinating area. And I, I don't know whether the craving is linked to a deficiency of iron or, or, or something else uh, that yeah. may be deficient in their diet as well. But it's an, um, a very intriguing uh, phenomenon. Um, and anyway, thanks very much. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Ken. Um, yeah, the issue of iron deficiency is uh, generally um, something that's, that, that's taken in to say that, you know, these women are craving for for, mm -hmm. for, 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 for clay because they've got a deficiency and sometimes it is the case actually um, but sometimes not mm. so we do need more research um, I think is next it will be David McCarthy hello David <laughs> hello Yolanda and hello, hello. Kat. thank you very much for that uh, fascinating talk. Um, what I did want to ask is, well, I wanted to get a feel of the volume of clay that is consumed by individual women uh, across pregnancy. Is it something that they just maybe nibble on um, or is could this be quite a substantial uh, component of their diet? And is there any evidence that clay ingestion can actually displace the ingestion of uh, other foods, so nutrient-rich foods, for example? Um, interesting question, David. In terms of quantities, um, the study we did last summer, we, we talked a great deal about quantities and you had someone saying, well, I can purchase a bowl of clay and consume it all in one sitting. And then someone saying, I will make it go a long way. Um, I could eat it for three days or so, but uh, 
there was evidence that women were generally consuming large amounts of large quantities of clay, such that at the point where they were due to give birth and, and they gave birth, the, the baby's heads were covered in clay. That's what the participants were telling us. Uh, so there is, um, yeah, okay, large so quantities. Yeah, so it sounds quite a significant volume on a daily basis. So is there yeah. any evidence that they are consuming this in addition to their usual diet or is it displacing some of the foods from their usual diet? For some women who found eating challenging during pregnancy, particularly in the first three months, it, so, it became sort of like a, a replacement, you know, that this is what I eat in the morning. Uh, if I can't eat at night, this is what I'm going to eat. Um, but also there were some who were mindful that, well, I still have to eat real food. Um, so it, it, it was mixed, it was mixed, you know, uh, but some of the women did eat much more and it compromised on what they would normally eat. Okay, thank you, very interesting. Yeah. Okay, um, I think the next, Next hand is Eileen O'Keefe. Please. Not sure, Eileen, if you have your mic on. Yes. Yeah, it's on its way. <laughs> yes, we can hear you now. Okay, Kath, hi, that was Hey, really, really interesting. That was really, really interesting, and um, and and much broader than the um, study that I was aware that you were doing. I mean, I think it's wonderful that you went back in into the history of uh, the uh, of of the use of these materials over a long period of time, and did show. Um, the wide range of cultural ra um, locations from which the ingest ingestion was taking place. Your presentation gives rise to lots and lots of different kinds of questions. One of the things that I would like to ask you about would be, and it's related, I think, to what Ke to Kelly's question, which is that there are vast numbers of questions that we could be exploring jointly uh, between the uh, communities here in the United Kingdom, which are diaspora communities, and the countries from which to which they are also related through their family background, cultural background, and their histories, and so on. And how far do you see scope available to us and to people carrying on the kind of research that you and Martha are carrying out to be able to do joint collaborative studies, for instance, between uh, let's say, a group at London Metropolitan <laughs> with a group in sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, do you see much scope for being able to explore really interesting questions about some of the questions of the way in which in what you call indigenous knowledge is itself being transformed all the time? in sub-Saharan sub Africa and amongst the diaspora communities right here in the UK. Do you see that an important uh, collaborative area of study? And then do you know of ways in which that could be supported and funded? Okay, um, thank you, Eileen. Um, Yes, I see. I, I, I see uh, a window of opportunity uh, for a collaborative study, um, particularly in 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 countries where um, 
there is there higher rates or higher prevalence of clay ingestion. And I think um, one of the ways in which the study can um, can can, uh, can can be framed would be around is there any clay that's safe? Because if mm -hmm. it's coming from the source and it's being imported here illegally um, and they are selling it over there, um, part of the revisiting of cultural traditions would be, okay, let's test the clay that is being consumed in this place and see if there's any clay that's safe at all so that we can inform um, the, in the interventions. It might be the case that there's no more clay that's safe for consumption at all, you know, um, or it might be that there is. And if there is, um, what, what, what can be done next about it? So I think, yeah, there, there is potential for collaboration in that sense. Definitely there is. You know, and also in terms of how we can raise awareness uh, to women about the dangers associated with ingesting clay um, before we can get to, hey, we've discovered clay that's safe. In, in the meanwhile, what do we do? We need interventions, but the interventions need to be designed in such a way that is culturally sensitive and culturally yes. appropriate. Yes. yes. Yeah. So yes. those are areas that I see potential collaborations. That's smashing. One final point, which is that there is an opening now in Britain, as far as I can make out, for appropriate research of that sort to be not only done, but funded. And quite recently, the Wellcome Foundation, the Wellcome Trust has said that um, they've got a new funding strand um, called the discovery, the discovery strand, which is specifically opened up to both the humanities and the social sciences, and where they are specifically looking for um, studies which looks at which looks at research from the community point of view, from the point of view of the uh, impact that research would have on specific communities. So your kind of research might really fit into that, where you say, look, we have communities who are engaged in practices. It is important to have a proper conversation about the issues of how successful pregnancy carries on amongst a whole range of communities. And this would be an area in which um, Welcome might be very interested. So that's to be looked at, perhaps. Yes, thank you for sharing that, Eileen. Um, I think you sent me a link, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> because I think it's so difficult to get funding for health research in the social sciences and humanities. And, you know, this is this is a completely new program that has opened up. And they specifically said they want research uh, proposals that have to do with the needs of communities themselves and the impact on those communities of the kind of research that's carried out. And they have yeah. also said that, you know, you can hook up with this can be carried out through links between the voluntary sector, NGOs and academics or whatever. So it's it's really opened up in a way that I think is very exciting. And yeah. um, they, the program specifically says they're aware that their previous funding has been uh, very wanting from the point of view of diversity and inclusiveness. So I would just recommend that people have a look at that. Definitely. Thanks, Eileen. I will, I will look at it. Definitely look at it. Thank you. Thank you. Can, um, I think Una um, has her hands up. Hi, hi. 
Um, please, please forgive me if I've missed this. My internet connection wasn't the best. Um, but it made me think of a couple of things. One of them was that, you know, in the West, people ha often ate kaolin, which is a clay, isn't it? Kaolin clay, because they felt sick to settle the stomach. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if the clay eating was associated with women feeling sick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, in, in terms of the study findings, yes women ate clay because they were nauseous and um the yeah and they were vomiting and they they ate clay to manage that okay and then my other um thought when you were talking was i wonder if eating clay was healthy or gave the body something else it helped the microbiome so i wonder if Women were getting a little dose of or are when they eat clay, a little dose of bacteria that are missing in normal diet because children eat soil and that's supposed that's associated with the reduced problems in immu in their immune system and so forth. So that occurred to me as well. Mm-hmm. 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 I mean I don't know if there's I, any back Sorry. Sorry, go on. I don't know if there's many bacteria left by the time you've treated the clay, but there might be. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's an interesting one. Well, but not all the clay is treated. Some of it is mm. eaten quite uh, original form. Mm. Uh, yeah. But I but there have been also uh, findings that some of the clay, when women consume it, they end up getting earthworms, you know. So I think some of the clay still has its bacteria intact. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, I think it does, but it's not an area that is well researched or in mm. terms of what we, the literature that we came across in terms of really pinpointing as to whether women needed certain bacteria from the, mm. from the clay in their bodies. Mm. Yeah. And then just to finish off for a laugh, um, I've had five children and every single time I've had them, I've craved to eating rubber. <laughs> 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 that's interesting particularly <laughs> orange rubber so like you know well no I won't carry on because people think I'm mad but anyway yeah I liked rubber <laughs> did you there consume you it <laughs> I did yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> thank you for sharing <laughs> thanks you you know um Kath I, I have a, a question if I may because I I can see that uh, at least we don't have any hands for the moment um so I think it's quite interesting um, bring, bringing you back to the framework that you talk about um, with that sort of um, integration of both type of knowledge. And obviously you say it's a type of, of, of dialogue, on, um, surely research to be done and consequently to be developed. Um, I I was thinking about the mental health area where where there have been some inroads in this direction of integration and I think it could be useful perhaps um, as a supportive you know when, when we draw on all other experiences even if it is mental health and you're talking about physical health or both probably it's a mix of both but the use of culturally adapted um, therapies whereby um, I'm sure you, people have heard of this but basically they have been included within the nice guidelines mm -hmm. and that means um, there's a lot of scholars I mean writing about it and practices in Newham for example whereby um, you have a psychiatrist um, delivering a type on psychologists a type of um, cognitive behavioral therapy, which obviously is a Western um, type of therapy, but adapted, culturally adapted in terms of mm. terms, in terms mm. of the delivery of that, of naturally using, using um, the ethnic groups that they are trying to treat as well, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is important because they understand the language 
what the meaning of the words and the how they interpret mental health or what is you know the, the, their mental health problems so there has been a lot of inroads in that sense so they delivery yeah. they they are delivering cognitive behavioral therapy but adapted with language mm -hmm. with words mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. being used by the groups that they are trying to treat yeah mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and and this is one part and the other part is incorporation of Spirit. I mean, uh, cases of uh, I mentioned Newham incorporating um, in the in the uh, instead of concealing or alienating people when they hear voices when they come and say, well, are the spirits, the evils, and whatever they feel or interpret the mental health problem might be, instead of working against all those things, they work with it, and that mm -hmm. means that they keep them in therapy somehow i mean keep the patients in therapy but at the same time they accept and they let them you know consult the the spiritual um, healers and and mm. whatever they would like to the religion background and so on they let them mm -hmm. attend those meetings and follow the and continue speaking about those spirits and at the same time they are mm -hmm. delivering mm -hmm. a bit of uh, the, you know, engaging with them as well, but the, delivering the therapy at the same time. So I suppose those crossing, yeah. I suppose mm -hmm. uh, it, it is uh, some. There is some evidence out there. Yeah, I, I yeah. understand that is another another part of of health. But they could be also informative in the way that they have worked um, in yes. order to to engage as you say rather than say oh this is you know hearing voices will exactly the same instead of saying you hear voices well you need to to stop hearing the voices but they are not working yeah. in that framework yeah. and they can yeah. freely speak about the evil and spirits which which resonates with saying well i'm eating clay oh no you should stop yeah. doing that Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think there are some 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 perspective where where these have um, somehow proven to work, or at least they are initiative in that direction mm -hmm. uh, as a as a as a framework. Because I think they are mm -hmm. very very similar. How to engage and marry these two perspectives? Because working separately is not well. Evidently, it's not conducive because. It's kept in silence on one side. The GPs don't know. We don't know. And this is a big, big question as well, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The idea mm -hmm. of what Eileen was saying before, and I think that um, the Wellcome Trust probably will be, I haven't read of, on that particular um, um, funding application, but um, new call, but I'm sure the Wellcome Trust has traditionally work um, interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. So I think that the big question, or, 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 or certainly it will be very interesting if you manage to engage someone from the biomedical sciences, yeah. able to, able to at the same time that you run some more health or culturally grounded uh, analysis, able mm -hmm. to uh, uh, to run some trials um, or, or analysis, follow up cases of women ingesting, you know, doing the, the, the more basic science <laughs> that is needed also. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's what I wanted to say. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. I, I, I think that's a very good example in terms of what's happening in mental health. Um, as you mentioned, that the, the dialogue is, is being changed and the use of words that resonate, etc. And I think it, if um i think that if uh if if biomedical science is to go universal and to go local as well as local then it needs to adapt to uh to to the different uh cultures to the different localities etc and the different understandings and i think that they are doing that really well in, in the example that you've given and i think yes um we can learn from that uh we can we can learn from that we can borrow from that you know the force of an example is powerful we can always use the example to try and uh, uh, and try to to tweak things um, because the current 
interventions do not even acknowledge the cultural component. There's no account, there's no acknowledgement of that at all. So that could be a starting point, you know. Um, yeah, I see, I, I see, I see uh, a, a point where we can learn from in terms of going forward, in terms of the dialogue. Mm -hmm. I will look more into it, actually. Thank you. No problem. I, I, I don't know if Eileen is an old hand <laughs> that you have there or, or is a new hand. Um, in between, uh, uh, sorry. Kelly had uh, asked a question here. Kelly yeah, I'm going to the chat here. Yeah. Oh, you okay, can see go the on. chat. No, no, yeah. no, carry on. I mean, you can see the chat, so you, you, you can. Okay, yeah. It says, is the practice primarily due to cravings or cultural practice? I think it's neither here nor there, Kelly. I think, you know, culturally, I think if you grow up in a culture where you're just socialized to seeing a pregnant woman eating clay because they're nauseous and you're told this is what you do, then you are going to eat it. But in terms of the cravings, I, uh, my, my personal opinion about the cravings uh, particularly is probably the issue of uh, mineral deficiency in terms of iron particularly um, because we do know that people who have got iron deficiency have cravings for certain things um, but then they would go on to eat the clay because it, it's, a, it's, a cult, it's a culturally sanctioned habit uh, it's acceptable. No one will say, hey, why are you eating clay? You know, so I think because in that sense, very context, it's very context de dependent. Whereas if you had strange cravings here, you probably say to your GP, oh, I'm, I'm having strange cravings. Is there something wrong with me? But people then tend to just eat the clay because they're craving for it. So I think culture does play a part because these people are socialized in this culture and it's acceptable you know to to eat out your craving of clay um, but if you look at the management of reproductive health then you'd kind of look at it as probably more informed by the culture because that's what people do to manage these things that um, that confront them in terms of dealing with pregnancy uh, I don't know if there are any other questions. Someone, Dama, says in some parts of Asia also they do in pregnancy. And I'm and, and touching on that point of, of Dama. I wanted to ask as well, Kath, if mm -hmm. it's only related, we only hear back from Africa. And, 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 and what you say at the beginning, that gays, um, the colonial gays, I mean, they have um, permeated, obviously, still is with us today, in other words, still yeah. considering this as, as that definition, current definition that you presented as being the primitive. Is, yeah. that, is that the reason why? Because we, I mean, it transcends much more as an African behavior. I have to say in between brackets, I, when I was searching for an image from all, I saw all the things that you mentioned. I mean, they mm -hmm. were all, number one, they were African markets that I saw online. I saw the Amazon, I couldn't believe that Amazon was saying clay. <laughs> um, yeah. I was searching, I know that the images obviously I couldn't use for, for, for copyright issues, so I need to put the image that I put. But, um, but the thing is, uh, coming back to the, to the Asian thing, I mean, it's, 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 what, what do you have to say about it? I mean, it's, it, it yeah. became the association of, of Africa and primitivism or tribes, as you presented in your definition, yeah. is, has something to do with that? Or is, you know, with, it, with that colonial gaze only applying there? Um, would, you, would you recognize that? It's interesting because um, we have the same, uh, there is evidence of uh, clay not uh clay being consumed not not just among asian pregnant women but also in in, in uh in in uh in, in, in central america um and uh, among native americans but i think in terms of um 
Africa, I think it's probably more pronounced due to, um, to the interest that uh, physicians had of preserving the lives of the slaves so that they could also kind of like keep their businesses going. Um, so it became an area of study, if you like, because they were looking out for their interests in that sense um, of making sure that, okay, if I have slaves, they should be in good health. And if they eat clay, they are not going to be in good health because I'm going to lose some money. Um, so perhaps that framing is more strongly associated um, with Africa in that sense as opposed to Asia, um, but there is evidence that Asian women who eat clay, women from Pakistani, Bangladesh, etc., they do consume clay. But when you look at the literature, there's a death of literature in terms of the colonial gaze having an impact in terms of how consumption is, uh, is framed you know mm -hmm. it probably exists that kind of literature it's just that probably we were not really directing our focus there but but it's limited mm -hmm. interesting yeah. i think one question one question from kelly um, is clay ingestion used in other instances for all, for all conditions uh, um Some people who are not pregnant, they eat clay. Uh, and this has given, this has given a rise to the idea that, or oh, they are probably um, anemic, uh, or they lack one mineral or the other, that's why they're eating it. Um, it has been uh, the case among children, um, but there's also evidence that clay was used to, um, if people were eating, poisonous food um, uh, years ago um, it was food that was eaten and it was you know it was their staple diet they would eat clay first so that the clay uh, would help in terms of uh, is it um, what what would I say in terms of uh, diluting the poison so that it's no longer poisonous to their intents to, to to them when they're eating it so there's that kind of evidence but it's it, but this is this is in the historical context um presently it's more about minerals and pregnant women trying to satisfy their cravings and managing pregnancy Okay. Um, Thank and you. Uh, people use it for facials as well, Kelly. Uh, people use it for facials. Uh, people use it to detox. <laughs> There's all sorts of all sorts of literature for it. Kath, can I ask um, a follow-up question? So, I mean, I think we've all been quite fascinated by the clay ingestion, and and that's you know where lots of the questionings come from. But I think the you know that what you're proposing is about sort of cultural awareness in public health engagement and decisions and, and that in itself is is something that i think um is really you know has the potential to be really powerful for lots of different communities um i think that the we've got slightly um <laughs> engrossed in the, in the subject of the actual clay but um, <laughs> Beyond the clay, you know, you, you, there's a really important message there that you're promoting, which is about how, you know, how public health initiatives, interventions, conversations are culturally sensitive, aware, inclusive, you know, all of those things. Um, and I suppose, you know, the, the dilemma is that there would be very many different views on different um, conditions and ailments and, you know, yeah. I think about my Irish granny and the types of things that she'd try and get us to do for when we were poorly. Um, things like drinking garlic and milk, the most disgusting thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but she would have sworn by it, you know. We you could you could class these as kind of old wives tales or, you know, but there yeah. there was yeah. you know, when you, when you look at it, some of these practices 
you know, arteries such as you know, clay is well known to be a, a filter. People use it to filter water, for example. Um, so yeah, yeah, I just think it's a really interesting concept and one that has a lot of potential. Um, and you know, there there would be an awful lot of discussion had and knowledge exchanged by health practitioners engaging in those sensitive conversations, wouldn't there? Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely, definitely. I agree. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, wow. Can I reproduce this, Brenna? Thank you, Joanne, for organizing this very interesting session, um, Cass. A lot of, um, well, probably it's the most engaging of the sessions that we um, had, in, at least from in the last seminars we had. Uh, and, um, and thank you so much, Cass. Um, I hope you enjoy it too. I hope we, don't, we didn't ex <laughs> exhaust you um, too much. Um, mm. And I also hope that. Um, this can lead to well to other yes um, engaging with, with with people and crossing um, crossing disciplines yes um, yeah to try to to organize uh, not organize to try to yeah and as Eileen said to try to develop opportunity for funding or exploring that area yeah. which it seems to be of, of, of interest um, within London Bent, I would say. Although, uh, yeah. There are people from, from the outside, of course, but um, joining us today. Thank you so much, Kath. Um, Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I, I enjoyed sharing. <laughs> I think I've been given more ideas as we go into, uh, we are just trying to analyze our findings from uh, for the previous study and we are thinking of the way forward. So I think I've picked up quite a lot of things in terms of um, ideas for the future. Okay. Thank you yeah. so much, Kath. And thank you to the audience as well. It has been so engaging and, and so interesting in, in, in all these um, questions and comments um, today.